What's going on, guys? Graham G. S. Matthews here with BleachReport.com. Today we're talking to two-time WWE champion, WrestleMania headliner, and author of Drew McIntyre, Our Chosen Destiny, right here, out in stores right now. Uh, Drew, what's going on, man? How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. How about yourself? Doing great. Is it weird to hear the author title kind of attached to your name now after all these years? Yes. It's very, very <laughs> weird. I cannot believe that I have a book. It's here, it exists, it's in my hand. The first ever book I read cover to cover was Mick Foley's Have a Nice Day. Uh, when I was about 13 or so, uh, I probably should have read other books, you know, for my English essays that I wrote at the time, but you can skim those things and put together pretty good essays. So it's wild all these years later, starting with Foley's book and all the other countless wrestlers books that I've got my eyes on that I have one of my own at 35. Were you like me in doing your book reports in school on wrestling autobiographies? I did whenever I got the opportunity, unless they allocated us, you know, of a salesman <laughs> or whatever, and we had no choice. I certainly always made it about wrestling. I gave a talk um, to my English class one time on wrestling. And I remember I, I talk about it in the book, The, the Secrets of Wrestling Books um, by Dennis Brent and Percy Pringle. I kind of used them as my template to put together my uh, my talk. And I got two different VHS players and kind of put together my own highlight video and played a CD in the background and showed this highlight video while doing my English talk and using my notes. And the code, I got an A for it, which was cool for one. And years later, I told Percy Pringle, Paul Bear, hey, I kind of plagiarized some of your book, <laughs> some of your work. <laughs> and, I got, and I got an A and he thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I feel like it's the projects that you're most passionate about, especially when it comes to like wrestling or something like that, that you're always going to get the A's on. Like one of my favorite projects, I did it, a book report on Batista's first autobiography, like 15 years ago as a freshman in high oh, wow. school. And uh, it was just, you know, it, it, it's always like that. That was when you do your best work. Um, you mentioned that you mentioned uh, Mick Foley's have a nice day. You mentioned that on raw talk last week, any other wrestling autobiographies that you either read growing up or read in the last couple of years that kind of gave you tips and inspiration for writing this book. My eyes in so many wrestling books. If you start naming them, I've probably read them. I remember like <laughs> WWE were releasing books like crazy after Foley's. There was a The Rock one, the Stone Cold one, an Edge one, a Kurt Angle one. Like I powered through all of those guys, but then I also got my eyes on you know Bret Hart's Dynamite Kids. This is just off the top of my head. Like a countless amount of wrestling books you know, that I put my eyes on. And I know she also said you did a book report in Batista 15 years ago. You know, I signed with WWE. 13 years ago and I was on the road with Batista about that time so that's pretty crazy like two years yeah, after you yeah. you did a book report on him I was traveling on the road which makes me feel pretty old I've been around for a long time though I remind everybody you know 35 just because I've been around for 20 years and WWE television for about 13 I'm still 35 I still get years left <laughs> That's the crazy thing, too, because I think you've been back with a company now for four years. Do you get fans or just people in general that you that think that you're still new to the product? Like you've only been here four or five years, of course, you're becoming champion now. But you got to remind people that you actually, re, you know, you started with a company, like you said, 13 years ago, 2008, arrived in the main roster in 09. Do you still get that experience with people? Do they think I'm one of the newer guys? Yeah. Yeah. And having just, yeah. debuted, you know, returned to the main roster a few years ago. Yeah, a lot of people, um, like our audience is ever um, changing and adding new new fans to the WWE universe, especially the younger fans. And they think I've just been around for, you know, a few years, unless they caught the, um, you know, lead up to WrestleMania last year, we could have talked about my history and lent into it. But you'd be surprised that like, my people don't I actually know my history and I get the opportunity to tell them about it through the book here, obviously. Uh, but in real life, whenever I get the chance to do it, you know, I sat with one of our um, newer commentators last night and we had a little talk about my history. And, you know, he's kind of still learning the business, learning everybody's story. And he was blown away when he mm -hmm. learned uh, that I signed so young and how many um, experiences I've had and all the ups and downs. And of course, I told him, get yourself a chosen destiny. It'll fill you in on everything. <laughs> but yeah, whenever I get the chance to, to tell the story, it does kind of blow people's minds that, wow, you had a whole other first chapter of a WWE career before this current one. Yeah, and it's all covered in the book, like you said. Uh, the book came out last Tuesday, so a week from when we're speaking right now. Have you had a chance to go out in the last week? Obviously, you're a busy guy being a WWE superstar, but to go out to a Target or a Walmart or a Barnes & Noble. I was at Target the other day, and I saw it alongside John Cena's new book, which was really cool. Have you had a chance to see it yet on the bookshelves? Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> 
unbelievable. I really can't wrap my head around that uh, I go to the local Target here and see myself on the bookshelf. And like, I, and I never saw Cena's book beside mine. Please get me a photograph of that. Like stuff like that. I'm still like a wrestling fan. I'm um, at heart, the biggest mark of all time. And um, I think that's what people kind of saw over the past year and why I started relating to, to our fans a little bit more when they realized, like, oh, he doesn't kind of look like all of us, but he is just one of us. And stuff like that still blows my mind to this day. In the last week, or really, I guess, since before the book came out publicly, um, has anyone had a chance to read it, whether it be your fa- uh, you know, uh, friends, family, peers that have given you some cool feedback to the book? Like, oh, either I didn't know this or I thought this was awesome, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, a lot of people, um, friends from Scotland um, who were there in the beginning stages of my career and kind of were the, I guess, the godfathers of the modern day British slash Scottish wrestling scene were amazed that um, the kind of genesis of it all, the story of it all is now in print for everybody to see and their names are tied to it. So they were excited their names were in there for one, but I also had the head of the Scottish Wrestling Hall of Fame as part of the you know, British Wrestling Hall of Fame committee write a review I was just reading earlier and he was so excited that you know a big part um, of British wrestling history is covered in the book so they're very mm-hmm. excited about that and um, myself is one of the more established uh, British wrestlers and first ever British WWE champion but it's very cool to hear like my brother and dad uh, message me and kind of talk about our family story uh, being in print and my mom's story in particular is no longer with us and um, was obviously I talk about in the book but the diffi- really difficult point in my life um, but you no, know, they're excited it's down there and I told my dad that I said that we're putting this out for the main reason is I want to help people through my story it's going to be written for wrestling fans and new fans to wrestling but the main theme is talking about the down times in my life and how I was able to overcome them and achieve my dreams especially during this time we're living in right now perhaps we can help a few people but at the same time you know our family legacies they right there in that book too which is really cool yeah and like you said I think you just you know, said it perfectly just right there that it's not just a wrestling book. It's a book that anyone can really relate to. When you've heard your story before, like you said, you had the 24 treatment last year, which was great. You were in Broken Skull Sessions with Stone Cold Steve Austin. But this really reaches a wider audience to where you don't have to have a Peacock account to read your story. Now, anyone can see just walking through Target or a Barnes and Noble, which is awesome. Um, with the book itself, and I know you mentioned when you started writing it, how it kind of came about. What was that process like for you? Was it, you know, we, we hear from a lot of writers and as a writer, myself i'm curious was it extremely frustrating to the point where you would never do it again and you wouldn't recommend it to anyone or was it equally rewarding to where you might be open to the idea of doing another book down the road uh i mean i'd be open to it um the response thus far for this one has been really cool um of course that is my actual life story if it was a negative response about that <laughs> matter everybody hates my life and my story <laughs> uh, so yeah you never know what the future holds but the process was really cool um there's a lot of stuff in there that i don't think about often and i perhaps haven't thought about since when it happened you know like the wwe life moves pretty fast and you got to kind of be present in the moment and to go back over my entire life especially my time over the past 13 years in america was awesome and um, just to see what I've been through, the lessons I've learned and not just my own stuff. The biggest thing to me that stood out was the amount of people that helped and supported and sacrificed along the way to make me not just the wrestler I am today, but the man I am today. And gave me a greater appreciation for my support system. And um, so I had a chance to kind of reach out to a lot of people, remind them of some stories and thank them for always being there. But uh, yeah, I love the process. I, re- I remembered something like during, uh, I think my last interview I hadn't talked about publicly that um, that the house I'm in right now, uh, when mm-hmm. my wife and I um, bought our first house, it was, I think I was out WWE for maybe a year at the time. And um, I remember we were looking for a place. We had our first apartment together. I talk about in the book how I got fired three days after we moved into our first apartment together. Mm-hmm. But about a year later, uh, when things were going pretty well, we we're looking for a house. And there was this one here that we're looking at. We're like, maybe it's a little out with our means right now. But there was this little table and it's just outside the office here that I looked at um, and I said to, to her when we're walking around the house, I was like, one day I'm going to pen my memoirs at this table right here. She was like, all right, Drew, whatever. So <laughs> uh, we're sitting in the apartment and uh, she gets a phone call from her friend who was the uh, real estate agent and basically said that house is about to go. Um, it's like a new house, a new community. You really have to give an answer right now. And she said, what do you think? Probably not the best idea. And I happened to be watching like a Sylvester Stallone documentary at mm-hmm. the time. And 
And he kind of tells, told the story about how he had the Rocky script and Hollywood were trying to buy it. He had no money to the point he had to sell his dog at a gas station to live, but he still refused to like, give up on his dream. He had the specific vision in mind that he was going to pull it off one way or another. He was going to will it into existence. And I just imagined myself writing the book one day at that table. And for some reason, <laughs> thanks to Sylvester Stallone in that documentary, I went, we're getting that house. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> and sure enough, this is the house we're still living today. I may have done most of the book work where I'm sitting right now, but mm. it's three feet from where I imagined it happened. Yeah. So that was a pretty cool story that I just remembered literally last week. Oh, that's funny. In an alternate universe, if you're not doing it in your house and if it's not a pandemic, would you still be writing this book like on the airplane, for example? I mean, you're, you'd be more on the road than you would be right now. Do you still think that you wouldn't be able to get the job done and getting this book written? Or I must have made it easier just being able to write it from your house. Way easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still would have got done. Like, again, it wasn't my ideal. You know, what the world needs right now is a Drew McIntyre book. <laughs> like, it was brought to my attention that, you know, your story, you're very open about it. And um, in every medium you're on, like interviews and on television, would you be willing to tell it? Maybe help a few people. That's why, why it started. And if that opportunity came, I, I would have absolutely took it to help anyone out there. But yeah, being at home obviously <laughs> made it a lot easier. I got a bit more free time than I used to have, which was no free time in the past, uh, to really go into it and really talk to family members and uh, friends who have a lot better memory than me. Like a lot of that period of the book, especially the difficult times, is like a bit of a haze. So I was able to you know, get a lot of people helping me, reminding me and uh, reliving some of the moments, to be honest, which as I talk about in the book is healthy to kind of be more open with your emotions, something I was not good with in the past. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, too, about, you know, kind of gathering these stories and remembering things you haven't thought about in a long time. And again, as, as a writer myself, I'm curious and as someone who wants to write a book someday um, in that in gathering these stories, especially with stories that, you know, you may thought would never be, you know, in, in a book for everyone to read and getting like the I guess permission might be the right word. Like, do you have to get permission for certain stuff from certain people like, hey, this is going to be in the book and now we're going to have to share this for the entire world to see. Was that a tough process for you or? Was it kind of easy just kind of asking all these people? Yeah, not really. Uh, it's not like a book where I'm like going into all the <laughs> dirt and trying to sell stories yeah, exactly. with, like, ne with negativity. Like it is positive. Like I mean, the only negative stuff is more, like on me and kind of the lessons I learned um, on the way. But for everybody else, like it's just um, fairly positive. For the family stuff, I did have to speak to my dad and brother and make sure they were comfortable with, you know, putting out some family stuff and, Mm -hmm. um, talking so in depth uh, about you know some of our personal stories and my mom's personal stories and they're good with it like they're, their mentality is the same as mine um, anyway we can keep her memory alive and tell her story what an incredible woman uh, she was they're all about it so that was the one thing I just wanted to make sure it was cool and you know run it past the misses of course you know as we <laughs> talk about in the book I was mildly out of control for a period of my life and she stood by my side and we kind of went into some of those stories so as long as they were comfortable in my close family then everybody else can yeah. deal with it because there's nothing negative in there about them <laughs> <laughs> well like you said it's a good thing this book isn't completely burying anyone it's not like a tell-all to the point where like it's just negative stuff like it's all positive stuff so and a lot of this yeah, stuff I, mean, I, don't, I don't see the point of that either like uh, i see people <laughs> like when they get released from wwe and they're just so negative and bitter and blame everybody else and don't take a look in the mirror and i was never that guy from day yeah. one i was just like accountable like for my actions i don't see the point of being negative, burning bridges, anything like that, because negativity can only bring negativity and positivity, even if you're going through a pretty negative time, can hopefully yield some positivity, but you know the result is negative. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned too, I mean, the timing of this book is just so incredible. You talked about your mother, you talk about your mother in the book. It's got to be amazing for this book to be coming out around Mother's Day. It came out last Tuesday, but the first you know, Mother's Day was two days ago as we speak. So the timing couldn't really be any better either. Yeah, that was really cool. And uh, a lot of people, um, I mean, Mother's Day is a different day in the UK than it is here. Oh, okay. but, uh, with Mother's Day being when it um, is in America and being released in America around Mother's Day, I got a lot of people sending me messages, um, you know, on Mother's Day, uh, on, like around this time in the past mm -hmm. few days, even leading up to Mother's Day, um, saying that, uh, you know, happy Mother's Day to my mom. So that was really cool. That's awesome. And you mentioned all the interviews you've done promoting this book, promoting WrestleMania, WrestleMania Backlash coming up this weekend on Peacock. You've been in this position now of a top tier guy in WWE for the last year, really dating back to the Royal Rumble in January of 2020. 
you know, I, I was watching the Miz documentary a couple of days ago, the 24, and he mentioned how nobody wants to do media days, but he volunteered to do it because he saw it as an opportunity to kind of further build his brand and become a bigger star. Do you kind of share that same mindset? Because you've done countless interviews over the last year. Do you kind of share that same mindset and seeing every interview as an opportunity to kind of make yourself a bigger star? Yeah, 100 um, percent. And I told Miz after I watched the documentary, and I tried really hard in these media interviews to make sure I keep putting you across as a bad guy, but then you get your show like Miz and Mrs. And then we get this 24 and like I know his story. And a lot of people backstage know his story, but now the world knows that he's been through some hell in his early career and he persevered. He never gave up and he worked harder than anybody on the roster and has deserved every bit of success that he has today in the ring and outside of the ring. So I was like, mate, like, I don't know how you do it. Like, you still get yourself over as a bad guy on television, but I can't keep pushing that narrative. You've screwed it all up now. I said, I'm just going to have to say <laughs> what a hard worker you are as you put it out to the world. But yeah, I always talk about like John Cena um, as somebody that I kind of like patterned myself after after I was released rather than learning from him in the moment when I was there on the mm -hmm. roster and maybe working within the system to better myself. It took getting fired and bettering myself personally before I thought, you know, who's somebody that to look up to in this business? What like, kind of mentality do I need? And I thought about John, just how relentless he was and everything he did, be it the media, the gym, in the ring, just every aspect of his life, just such a workaholic. And Miz is exactly the same, followed that same path. And I said to myself, I'm going to be that guy too. And I was outside of WWE and within WWE, I knew as soon as I was given any kind of position where I was able to take the reins and get the media opportunities and they want to speak to me, I was going to take full advantage of it. The second I had that title, I was like, give me it all. I said, I'm the guy now, there's no excuse. I want every single bit of it. I get the opportunity to talk about WWE. At the same time, I'm talking about uh, Drew McIntyre and trying to better myself in that area this isn't work this is a, like my lifelong dream so if anybody considers what we're doing right now work then a freaking idiot go out and get a real job or talk to your family members and friends of what real jobs are because i do <laughs> for the last year and a half i mean this is what you've been doing really since you won the wwe championship the first time at wrestlemania kind of going off that it has in being in this top elite position in wwe has it met exceeded been everything you've hoped for if your expectations as a top guy or has it been completely different kind of talk about that process a little bit compared to where you were on the card so to speak like a year and a half ago yeah i love it i love the extra responsibility um i love like the responsibility on the show like in particular but obviously off the show and mm -hmm. the new chances i get i learn more about the company and all the different areas and how many people it takes to keep this global juggernaut WWE running. And it's truly unbelievable. It gives me a greater appreciation for the company. And I get afforded opportunities to do the, the really cool stuff like the charity work and, and do the virtual hospital visits. Um, like for September, Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month, the tribute to the troops, meeting all the troops prior to the virtual event and the virtual meet and greets uh, with the fans where we still get to interact. Mm -hmm. in that capacity and the thing that always amazes me during those virtual meet and greets if they're like, like fans are allowed a couple of questions we get a couple of minutes but they usually forsake them to like say thank you which blows me away every single time and um, because that like most of them are like so hardcore they know my story they know the ins and out and they literally forsake their questions to take the time to say thank you and that really blows me away every time but that uh, you know real stuff if you like that's been the coolest thing i've been able to do the past year the only thing I've been missing, obviously, is those live fans in attendance. There's a, a lot of big moments over the past year I would have loved to have live with the WWE Universe in person. But um, as we talk about in the book, my journey made me the man I am today. They made me the only man to kind of lead the company during a worldwide pandemic because there's nothing I've not seen <laughs> that I've not gotten through and nothing was going to phase me when I finally reached the top, including a worldwide pandemic. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, going off of, you know, WrestleMania, like you said, was their first show back with fans. I had a chance to be there as well. It was just a great event. You kicked off the show for night one um, with the WWE Championship match with Bobby Lashley. When you come out and, and the match was great, the match with Bobby Lashley was our first match back with fans in over a year, a year, a month and a day, I think it was. Um, and you get the 50-50 reaction. People were behind Bobby, but they were also behind you. Were you surprised by that? Were you expecting that? Because it seems like at this point, it's, it's hard to tell who is in, you know, extremely, I guess, over might be the right word, whatever it is. Were you surprised by that reaction or not really? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest. Like you mentioned I've been in the WWE title scene since January 2020. Yeah. Uh, literally a year and a half of constant Drew content 
Uh, you know, Drew's generally opening the show, his main event in the show, multiple segments. He's all across social media. Like you've seen a lot of Drew. And in the past, when that's happened, sometimes our fans, you know, look for the next cool thing and their attention span waivers. And perhaps they're not going to stay into that person because they're like, okay, we like this person, but okay, what's the new thing I want to kind of get into right now or even reject uh, the person is supposed to be the good guy. So I really didn't know. All I knew was I don't mind. I've been around long enough that as long as they care, one way or mm. another, as long as there's no silence when I walk out there, <laughs> uh, that's all I care about. And I'm like I say, I roll with the punches. I adjust to the fly. When you've got fans live, you're able to do that. Kind of adjust how they're reacting is how you dictate uh, in the pace of your match and your interviews, etc. But to walk out and just hear the reaction and cheer initially when I walked out just blew my mind. And I did the three, two, one with the sword. Uh, which I didn't plan to do. That wasn't something I intended to do. They just the reaction blew me away. And I was just like, oh, wow, with the live fans, I need to do something interactive. I'm going to do the three, two, one. So I was just so in the moment. I came down and say, heard them all the way to the ring. You can see when you watch it back, I'm almost at the point of tears. I literally was just so emotional for that moment. Bobby came out, heard the great reaction for him too. And I was like, cool, look what we're doing with Bobby's working as well. This is great. Mm -hmm. Like we're like taking up a lot of TV time <laughs> right now. So you you want when you're, you're like uh, being on the show so much as we are, you want fans to be digging it and you want them to care and react to be emotionally involved and to hear that kind of response for each of us for that match really was like a cool moment for both of us out there. And the big surprise at the end, everyone thought I was going to win and have that moment and kind of caught them off guard when I went out to the, uh, what do you call it? The Lashley look. Um, at the oh, end, yeah, the like, Lashley lock, yeah. Hurt yeah, lock, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of cool. Hurt lock, that's the one. I keep messing up the name. <laughs> I need to find many counters for it, but I can never remember the name. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that was kind of cool too, because like it's just like, the book tells you nothing ever goes to plan in Drew's life. Everyone just assumes finally Drew's going to get his moment with the fans, going to have the title, he's going to raise it up. Big firework display. This is the one hey, after last year, not having any fans. But no, Lashley wins the match. We cement ourselves another top level main event performer in Lashley. And it just goes with the Drew story of another obstacle I have to come. Every time you knock me down, I'm going to adapt, overcome, and come back stronger. Yeah, and it just keeps it unpredictable, too. And now because of that, we have the triple threat on Sunday with yourself, Lashley, and Strowman for the WWE Championship, which is going to be a great match after all the recent interactions you guys had on Raw. Um, it, it's got to be a tougher position to be in this position and not, you know, to go from rising up the card and, and endearing yourself to the audience. It's got to be harder now to maintain that popularity, right? Especially with how you kind of mentioned with how fans can be. Sometimes they're always looking for that next thing. Who's the new next hot star or whatever. Is this a more difficult position to be in compared to where you were again with or without fans going into WrestleMania last year? Uh, I mean, like if you look at it, like I'm not, like the fresh new kid on the block and mm -hmm. um, yeah but for me now like now everyone knows exactly who drew mcintyre is they know what i'm about and i'm going to continue to be drew mcintyre i know exactly who i am as a character it's not far off the real person mm -hmm. and i'm going to continue just to be me and um, evolve the character add more layers wherever i can like you know watch raw last night i'm always they're trying to add a little lesson that Drew's learned along the way at WrestleMania. I stupidly allowed myself to be distracted by MVP, turn, literally turned my head. That cost me um, the match. I wasn't able to connect with the Claymore last night. I made a promise uh, that I was going to hit that Claymore. At the point of the match, MVP tried the same stuff, was banging in the apron, trying to get my attention. Never took my eye off Bobby one time during that match. Executed the maneuver I was going for, finally hit that Claymore. So Drew's always going to learn, adapt, um, and hopefully you know the fans keep digging it. And if they don't, as long as they're emotionally invested, as long as they're making noise, we've seen our good guys in the past get massive, <laughs> massive booze, but people are emotionally invested one way or another. But I, I think it's pretty crazy that from what I gather, um, you know, people have been pretty much digging what I've been doing for like a solid year and a half. And I really appreciate that. It's not lost in me, like how difficult that is to do in today's day and age. Yeah. And from a fan's perspective, I can attest to that as well. Um, with everything that you've done over the last year during this pandemic, is there any one element? We talk about the negatives of the pandemic era, obviously, but is there any one positive from this pandemic era that you would take to when we get back fans and hopefully six months or so or whatever it might be? Something that you've seen that you want to adapt into the you know regular product when fans are back? Hmm. I've got a bunch of stuff, but um, you know, off the top of my head, um, I keep doing it and I'm getting away with it. Like I break the fourth wall all the time. Like I'm always looking down the camera and I really loved when wrestlers used to do that back in the day. And I yep. noticed like in WCW in particular, a lot of the guys would, would do it and maybe too many people would do it. Um, but uh, for our show, that was the first thing I did because uh, right away I was like, we need to reach our fans. We need to connect with our fans. We don't have them in the building, especially in the performance center, warehouse, no fans. 
I was the first one looking down the lens. I did it at WrestleMania when I won mm-hmm. the title and continued it on, kind of made it part of my thing. And I, and I still use it uh, when I'm directly talking to someone or to punctuate something or to reach everyone at home and I want to deliver a specific message. And uh, not everybody does that or perhaps is supposed to do it, but I do it, continue to do it. And I probably will continue to do it because I remember what it was like when I was a kid. As I said earlier, I never lost that fan aspect. And I remember when people looked at me right down the lens, especially if it was something particularly emotional, they'll try to drive a point home. I felt it because they were talking right to me. So that's something I'm definitely going to keep going. There'll be countless other things I can't even think of right now, I'm sure. No, no, that's a good one. And uh, last question for you, Drew. How often over the last year in all these interviews that you've done, have you been asked about, broken dreams when are we going to hear it again obviously the new song fits you so perfectly well we don't need to go backward but as a one-off thing how often do you get asked that on twitter and in interviews and stuff like that and is there a chance to kind of copy that myself that we could hear it as a one-off at some point down the road yeah i definitely hear about it at least <laughs> like once every few days if not yeah. at some point and leading up to wrestlemania i'll hear about it every day like every yeah. year if we're heading towards mania this is the year this is where he's going to do it maybe i'll drop a little teaser or something online just to encourage people <laughs> but um yeah the only time we used it was uh the build-up video for myself and bobby Roode uh, yeah. for the nxt title uh, we managed to get it in there as far as i'm aware the company i uh, do have the rights um, to use the song eventually it will happen i don't know when it will happen but the people want it enough and here's the thing if i push for it and it does happen i expect an arena full of people to know every single freaking word because the way that everyone's tweeted me for years you would assume everyone knows every word so don't let me down if it happens i expect everyone to have that lyric sheet learned if it, if it silenced then it falls on the fans and it's their fault so we're gonna we're gonna yeah, hold people i'll say afterwards that. like you ruined it we had, the, we had the chance. We used it one time and I expected everyone to know every word so I could come in the back and go, see? Or we're going to have to come in the back and go, oh, I don't know what to tell you. They've bothered me for years and they just didn't care. <laughs> Hopefully at some point we can get it. But in the meantime, people can check out the book. I don't know if it comes across here on the screen, but Drew McIntyre, My Chosen Destiny, available everywhere. Target, Barnes & Noble, Walmart. There it is. Perfect. People can check it out. It's Look a great book. Names. Oh, man. Triple H, Shawn Michaels, <laughs> Bret Hart, Billy Corgan even. I mean, the hell of endorsements. It's amazing. But we also got the pay-per-view on Sunday. You're a busy man for WrestleMania Backlash on Peacock. It's going to be fantastic. Drew, thanks for the time. And I forgot to say this. I love the Pickle Rick shirt. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. I was wondering if anyone was going to notice today. <laughs> I didn't realize I was wearing it, honestly, until we went on live. Usually I'd change into a McIntyre shirt or a Tark shirt. And as soon as we went live, I went, oh, I'm still wearing my Pickle Rick shirt. <laughs> I think you were wearing thanks that for during the 20... 20- I think you were wearing that during the 24 or something like that too. Cause I remember you wearing that in some other like interview or video or documentary you were doing. Oh, this is a good chance. Yeah. This is my regular rotation. This guy, my Ron Swanson shirt, my resident evil shirt that always popping up in my social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice break from the norm. It's fantastic and refreshing. Well, Drew, thanks again, man. This has been awesome. I appreciate the time. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. Thanks man. Until next time.